Hi, I'm Mr. Dove, and welcome to Bio Lessons to Go. This is an introduction to DNA. Now, once DNA was shown to be the genetic material, there was a race among scientists to work out its final structure. Now, DNA, also known as deoxyribonucleic acid, was known to be a polymer, a long polymer, made up of building blocks called nucleotides. Now, each nucleotide has three parts. A 5-carbon sugar, in the case of DNA, that's deoxyribose, a phosphate group, and a nitrogen-containing base. So this is a picture of DNA. We have our 5-carbon sugar, the de deoxyribose. We have our phosphate group, and it's basically a phosphorus with four oxygens, and then one of four nitrogen-containing bases. Now, there are two groups of bases. Um, they're classified based upon um, their structure. They are the purines and the pyrimidines. The purines are adenine and guanine, abbreviated with an A and a G. And then the pyrimidines are thymine and cytosine, abbreviated with a T and a C. You'll notice that the purines are a double ringed structure whereas the pyrimidines are only a single-ringed nitrogen base. They're nitrogen bases because they all contain nitrogen. So there's a hint uh, on how you might remember the difference between purines and pyrimidines. One, if you look at the word pyrimidine, thymine, and cytosine, they all have a Y in them. So that would be an easy way to remember the pyrimidines. In terms of the purines, you could do that by process of elimination, or, this is kind of a tricky one, um, on the periodic table, AG is silver. And so you can think of pure silver. And if I want pure silver, I would love to have two rings of pure silver. Um, so those are some ways that maybe you can remember the difference between purines and pyrimidines. So we have these two bases. But how would they go together? Well, the answer to this was derived by a scientist by the name of Erwin Shargaff in 1949. He was experimenting with samples of DNA and kind of comparing their basic composition. And no matter which organisms that he analyzed, he discovered that there always seemed to be uh, certain ratios of bases. Wherever he saw an adenine in A, there was an equal amount of thymine. Wherever he saw a C, there seemed to be an equal amount of guanine. So he concluded that they must come in pairs. It's kind of like with shoes. If you have 15 right pairs, you're going to have to have 15 left pairs of shoes. So if you have 15 A's, we're going to have 15 T's. And so this has come to be known as Chargaff's base pair rules that adenine always goes with thymine and cytosine always goes with guanine. Now as we began the race to try to figure out the structure of DNA, there were a lot of scientists that threw their hat in the ring. And one of the early pioneers was an American scientist by the name of Linus Pauling. Now Pauling was working with various proteins and he remembered that there's a lot of proteins that he's been studying that had kind of a helical shape. So he wondered if DNA also shared this same basic structure. As he was trying to model his uh, DNA, uh, he thought that perhaps it was actually a triple helix. Unfortunately, that was incorrect. One of the reasons he was incorrect is he didn't have enough information to deduce the actual structure of DNA. The piece of evidence that he was missing uh, was actually produced in 1953 by scientist Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins. Now they were using a technique known as X-ray crystallography to basically create an image of DNA. The way this works is you crystallize a sample of DNA. So the DNA is going to become crystallized, and then we shoot x-rays through it. 
Uh, some of the x-rays are going to bounce back and be captured, while others will pass through the empty spaces of the DNA. And if you have a photographic film on the other side, um, then you're actually going to get an image um, of the DNA structure. This is a picture of that very photograph, that famous photograph number 51. If you were to analyze this, the telltale X that we see in photo 51 uh, to the trained eye would indicate that we do indeed have a helix. When we have these uh, spaces on our X, these various spaces that exist, that indicates that we might actually have a double helix. Because we have uh, small spaces in some pace places and then large spaces um, near the ends of the X, that tells us that it's a consistent helix that has both major grooves and minor grooves. Fortunately, uh, two gentlemen uh, had an opportunity to observe the famous photograph of 51 and put together uh, their own observations along with the conclusions of Erwin Shargaff to deduce the final structure of DNA. Those gentlemen were, in 1953, Francis Crick and James Watson. Using all of the evidence that had been gathered, they were able to figure out the final structure of DNA. As a result of figuring out that DNA is a double helix, um, our pioneers, James Watson, Francis Crick, as well as uh, Maurice Wilkins, all received the Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1962. Unfortunately, because Rosalind Franklin had died, she was uneligible for um, getting the Nobel Prize. And one of the rules is that Nobel Prizes are not given posthumously. Um, they're not given after death. And so unfortunately, um, she was not recognized um, with the Nobel Prize for her hard work. Though modern scientists um, do give a lot of uh, support and um, really appreciate um, her contributions to unraveling uh, the secrets of DNA. So Watson and Crick proposed that DNA is shaped like a twisted ladder. It's a double helix. So I know this sounds silly, but DNA is a double helix, which contains the sugar deoxyribose. So it's like triple Ds. So DNA is a double helix with the sugar deoxyribose. Now, if we untwist the DNA ladder and we just look at the sides, the uprights of the ladder, um, it contains repeating shapes. We have our little pentagon here, which is our five carbon deoxyribose sugar. Um, at each one of these uh, little corners, you can imagine that there's going to be a carbon in there somewhere. And so that's why it's drawn as a pentagon, because we've got this five carbon sugar. Um, the carbon, the sugars themselves are connected by uh, a covalent bond, a strong covalent bond, which is called a phosphodiester bond. Um, and that connects to a neighboring phosphate. And so the sides of the ladder are always going to be sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. Now we need these sides of the ladder um, to be held together by that strong phosphodiester covalent bond so that when DNA is copying, uh, when DNA is being read in the nucleus, um, it doesn't fall apart. Now if we look at the center of our ladder, the actual rungs where you would put your arms or you put your hands as you climbed up the ladder, that's where we're going to find our bases. So the nitrogen bases make up the rungs, and they're always going to be paired together. The A with the T, the C with the G, adenine with thymine, cytosine with guanine. One way that you might remember um, uh, Shargaff's base pair rules is straight letter A goes with straight letter T, 
and curve letter C is always going to pair with curve letter G when we're talking about DNA. Now these bases, these pairs of bases, are going to be held together by hydrogen bonds. And remember, hydrogen bonds um, are relatively weak when we talk about all the different bonds and their strengths. And there's a reason for this that we'll get to in an upcoming episode. But basically, um, in order for DNA to work, it has to be able to unzip. And in order to unzip the DNA and open up this center, we need them to have a relatively weak connection. Now, Shargaff um, was able, we were able to look at and figure out, well, why would these bases um, go together the way that we know? Well, based upon the structure of DNA, we know that DNA has a definitive um, diameter. And if two purines go together, then the DNA would be too wide. If you had two pyrimidines together, then it would be too narrow. But just like Goldilocks and the three bears, if you have a purine and a pyrimidine, an A with a T or a C with a G, it's going to be a perfect fit. They're going to make that perfect diameter of DNA. Now, lastly but not leastly, DNA has a very interesting arrangement of the phosphates and the sugars. On one side, if you notice, it's going to start with a phosphate, and then over here, it ends with a, a sugar. Over here, it starts with a sugar, and then it ends with um, a phosphate group. So because each side of the DNA goes in opposite directions, we say that it is an anti-parallel molecule. While they both, while they parallel, they go um, parallel to each other, um, each strand goes in opposite directions. The end, which starts with a phosphate, is referred to as the five prime end because the phosphate is connected to the fifth carbon on our um, on our sugar here. So it's called the five prime carbon. So this is the five prime end. And the way that the best way I can remember it, way to remember it is five prime is the phosphate. Um, they have the same consonant sound. And over here we've got our um, where our sugar is. And this is going to be the three prime end. So one side goes five to three. The other begins at three and will go to five. This structural uh, element of DNA is going to be an important one as we start talking about how DNA replicates and how DNA is read to produce our traits. Um, so hopefully uh, you had an opportunity to understand the structure of DNA. If you have any questions, um, please be sure to ask um, or rewatch the video um, to see if you missed anything.